With that general uh, welcome to all of you, I'd like to turn the floor over to the chair of uh, the Cambridge Police Executive Program's International Advisory Board, uh, Sir Dennis O'Connor, uh, uh, retired as uh, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary and many other distinguished positions in British police service, uh, who will offer you uh, some additional uh, insights and words of welcome as well. Sir Dennis. Good evening, everybody, and uh, there's some of you here I know who give me a hard time, so I'm pleading in advance uh, this evening, um, Cynthia and others. Uh, but, okay, I think this is really a very, very exciting time. It's an exciting time in this country, and it's an exciting time internationally. Um, at the board today, we had a number of chiefs um, and others who are actually people who are in charge of things, decision makers, who actually doing this, okay, doing it live. Um, and it's lovely to be here on a summer's evening. This is a proper British summer's evening. Uh, if we did a randomised control trials on, on this territory, it would look pretty grim, but we're going to suck it up and enjoy it while we're here. It's a very benign summer, British summer's evening. The climate for policing in this country and elsewhere, of course, has never been benign. And... Um, Wherever you look, even if you've got a lot of money, people want a lot of effectiveness. If you've got less money, they still want effectiveness, and what they all want is legitimacy. And we have significant issues running in the country at the moment about integrity in British policing. Uh, some that makes people's hearts, who've been in it for a long time, turn. Um, but it makes them vow to want to do better. Uh, integrity questions are always uh, directly coupled with democratic policing. The problem is the specification on integrity advances at leaps and bounds, um, as does the specification on effectiveness. But you are very well placed to help it advance. Now, there was somebody in the audience who, oh, about 18 months ago, when we were talking about a college of policing, and there was going to be a conference with chief officers, said, well, maybe it should be a, cath a cathedral we aim for. Didn't you? And, and I said, absolutely, we should aim for a cathedral when we build a college. Not necessarily in the sense that it has all those that magnificent columns and the art uh, and the soaring, soaring views all around it. Not just because it's something that takes a lot of resilience and time and energy, but because it's a sense of what you can be, what you can believe in. It's something that moves your soul. Now, knowledge, the development of knowledge, can grip you like that. And clearly, because a lot of you are here, it grips you. Um, I think most of you want to be part of some cathedral, because you want to help lift people's eyes, lift their futures, lift their ambitions. I think there is a very great irony in policing. You see, I spent a lot of my life trying to do it with an eye over my shoulder towards research. I think, like the cathedral, there are an awful lot of people who can do things. What we're trying to do with evidence-based policing is we're trying to combine knowing and doing. And the cathedral, of course, embodies that perfectly. It doesn't just look at the... How do they span the nave which was a big question for a long, long time. Uh, and, and they had thinkers and doers. They had a frenzy of activity. Salisbury Cathedral and Notre Dame, whatever. You look at those places. Hopefully you're engaged in, an, in your own little way in a kind of a frenzy mm. of building, building knowledge. Now here this evening we're going to have a hope. I, I see you all as pilgrims in a sense. I'm a pilgrim. I just wish I'd got here a lot earlier. But we're going to have a couple of pilgrims who came to Cambridge. One of them is here, the, the, the former shape of Sarah, who, who, amongst other things, looked at domestic violence and said, you know what, this isn't going to plan. Um, and Alex, who's, I think, got a track record when he gets here, he's got previous, as they say, in the trade, 
for stop and search, that uncontroversial, stop and frisk, that uncontroversial little tactic. Um, so these are specifics. But these, these guys came here as pilgrims and they left as pioneers and they've been doing stuff since. Actually, the truth is they were doing stuff before they came here. So they brought that knowing and doing together and they are in a very good position now as Chief Constable, as Chief Executive of the College of Policing, to combine knowing and doing in a different way that works for our time, works for the people, and brutally works politically as well. It has to, it has to tick all of those boxes to succeed, however hard it is. Now listen, the thing is, Larry said to me the other day, you know what, we're almost over 800, I think, in the Society of Evidence-Based Policing. And I think that's fantastic. We have people actually doing stuff really close to the coalface. We have people at various mid and other leadership positions. It's caught on in government. Even Her Majesty's opposition are interested in it. And it's, it's got um, a following elsewhere in the world. I think it's graduating from being a society to a movement. And I think you guys on the side of history, because history is on the side of knowledge. And I hope in your own little way you're all going to make history. Um, because you are going to push that knowing doing to another place. And now, without any more of ado, I'll ask Sarah to tell us how knowing and doing are going to be pushed to a new, going to be pushed to a new place in relation to police professionalism. Sarah. Thank you very much, Dennis, and good afternoon. And it's really nice to be in, in Cambridge um, because I think Cambridge, for many of us, is a, is a very special place of collaboration with not just the British Police Service but police services throughout the world. And I think, um, well, thank you for inviting me, Larry, to speak today, but also thank you for all the work that you've been doing in terms of not just promoting evidence-based practice, I think, but actually promoting a different sort of professionalism in policing, which I think uh, we, we all need. You'll be glad to hear, I, I sat next to your Vice-Chancellor at a lunch, a rather splendid lunch, last week, uh, and uh, I was extolling the virtues of uh, Professor Sherman to your Vice-Chancellor. It's quite interesting because he's a medic by background, so he understood exactly the points that we were talking about, about evidence-based practice and the importance of that. And I think uh, I was trying to do a bit of missionary work for you, and uh, I, I thought he would know you intimately, but he then explained to me he did have 600 professors, so um, that was maybe his reason. But it's a serious point. I think the relationship uh, that Cambridge has developed under Larry's leadership with the service is something to, to be very proud of. The second thing I was just going to say by way of introduction, uh, and uh, Alex Marshall and I were teasing each other last week about whether I would pinch all the best lines if I was speaking before him. Well, he's not going to know, is he? Because he's not here yet. Um, but uh, one of the things that I'm very, very encouraged and excited about is the establishment of the college uh, at the end of last year. It was something um, that we worked very closely with the previous police minister and with this, this new police minister, Damien Green, on its development and how it would work to complement uh, the activities of, of chief officers, and particularly uh, the Association of Chief Police Officers. And so um, I'm very excited about that prospect and, and the work that Alex has set about doing. I, as a, a vice president of ACPO, the association, sit uh, as a director on the board with both Dennis and Larry. So I think, you know, we're at a great time. The pressures on policing could never be more, but actually the opportunities could never be greater. So, without more ado, you might have noticed, if you're eagle-eyed, that I've inverted um, the title I was given, because I think it said Evidence and Police Professionalism. And the re Ah, Alex, hello. I'm pinching all your best slides. <laughs> um, I've inverted the title, because what I want to do, essentially, is to make the argument from professionalism to, to the use of evidence. Um, and it's um, building on an argument that I've made before, because... Basically, like anything in policing, I think it's always good to take an outside-in view of you know, what's happening in the world, which we need to respond to. That's how we develop the strategy. And therefore, um, one of the things that I want to talk about, first of all, is, is why I think professionalism in policing has never been more important. And I think the person who will hopefully make the point for me is one of my favourite politicians, Ken Clark. Um, this is uh, any questions from, from earlier this year. 
uh, and I can't even remember what particular policing scandal had provoked this, uh, but he was basically being asked on any questions about where the police in this country uh, worse than they've ever been. And this is what he said. I share all concern, but I think it's totally wrong to think things are much worse now than they used to be. I'm the kind of age where I should say, ah, oh, things aren't what they were. What's happened, actually, is public debate has got more acute, and we worry more, and we expose more than we used to. There were more crooks and mass crimes when I first got in. Uh, I can remember what the West Midlands Regional Crime Squad were like when I was investigating. I can remember most appalling scandals in the health service when I was administered. My officials were shocked because I wanted to investigate them. The whole notion of cover-up. The whole notion of, no, 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 just let's uh, it over. Bad for the reputation of the poor, bad for the reputation of anybody, was prevalent 20 years ago only. What we do now is we have a very, sometimes, over-the-top arrest. We have public inquiries, we prosecute people. This hacking scandal, this hacking stuff's been going on for 20 years, and it's getting worse and worse and worse, and at last we're prosecuting people, and the police are better behaved than they used to be. They need to be made better if we can, even possibly, by improving the I hate, I hate cutting any of you. We'll cut him off there. But I think, for me, that really so powerfully makes the point um, that the standards, the way we operated 20 years ago, 10 years ago, are just not what the public expects now. Whether you call it the era of accountability, whatever you call it, um, the uh, pressure on all of us who work in public service to be better, to be more effective, to be more transparent, to be more ethical, uh, has never been greater. And I was reminded of this. It was a very good article by uh, David Aranovich in the Times last week, or it might have been two weeks ago. This was um, after the last set of uh, scandals in policing, but basically um, his head- headline was Shock, Horror, Britain Less Secretive Than Ever. Uh, and he said that in each case we have publicly funded organisations seemingly putting their own self-preservation above the needs of the people who pay their wages. In some cases, they seem to have conceived of their own sexual interests as having been in some sense synonymous with the public interest. In others, it looks to have been a matter of suppressing material that would have caused embarrassment. He, he talked about, in that article, uh, in policing terms, um, not only um, the um, revelations around Hillsborough, he was talking about the Care Quality Commission, that's the um, inspectors of the health service, who seemingly uh, uh, suppressed a very negative report about their own work. But he was also talking about the latest allegations with regard to the Lawrence Inquiry. And he talked about it being kind of a what on earth moment. I think that was the polite way of, there might have been a more kind of Anglo-Saxon way of describing it, but a, a what on earth moment. But his point was not to castigate public services, but it's the same point really that uh, Ken Clark was making, um, that uh, things are not worse than they used to be. We just know an awful lot more about what's going on. And therefore, the uh, requirement for us all to act with a greater uh, degree of professionalism couldn't be more important. And the other thing which I find really interesting on that quotation is this issue about sectional interest versus public interest. And I think that we need to be very careful that we don't confuse the two. And that I I, I do recognise what he says, that sometimes, particularly those of us in policing, you know, if if the police aren't standing tall, then there'll be kind of rampant disorder. Um, and therefore, our interests are the same as the public interest. They're not, and I think we need to think, think very carefully uh, about it. And just to use uh, one, uh, an academic, um, David Smith, um, who did a lot of really interesting work in the Met uh, many years ago, um, writing here on police legitimacy. I'm not going to give a lecture on Tom Tyler, because I'm sure you could all give it too, but you all, I'm sure, understand the importance of legitimacy leading to compliance uh, with the law and, and how um, that legitimacy makes, makes the life of our officers on a day-by-day basis much, much easier. So what, what David uh, Smith's arguing here is that if we really uh, care about legitimacy, the most um, effective way to cultivate that is about the way we operate uh, on the street, the values and ethics of policing as a profession. And I, um, we've got some very new... Um, body-worn video, which we've just rolled out in Slough, um, and I was watching some over the weekend. It, it kind of made, it didn't make riveting TV because it went on and on, but I was looking at three extracts, and it's all from uh, Saturday before, so the week before. Really difficult situations uh, my operational officers in Slough were dealing with. 
One where you had a young lad who clearly had mental health issues. One where they were trouble, struggling to, to communicate with people who I suspect were from Eastern Europe. And a third case uh, where there was just so many people who drank far too much and you couldn't really understand exactly what was going on. And it was a really good uh, refresh for me to see exactly what uh, they were dealing with. And I'm sure uh, that our colleague from America will talk more about body-worn video uh, in a couple of days' time. Um, so that would be my third point, that if we're serious about legitimacy, and I think most of us in this room would be, then thinking about policing as a profession uh, is really important. When we were doing the work on the college, um, we kept talking about professional bodies. What does it mean to be a profession? One of the um, quotations that I used, I think uh, Kira McGuigan of the College of Policing found this for me, uh, Hoyland John, and I, you know, we bandy around the idea of profession, and I, I now can think, well, what is a profession? Well, there are three things. There's the expert knowledge, there's the uh, independence of, of thought and judgment, uh, and thirdly, a commitment to a set, set of principles. Uh, and so clearly, if we're talking about evidence-based practice, um, that the importance of expert and specialist knowledge is, is right there at the heart of what it means to, to be a profession. I think it's probably worth mentioning the two other issues, um, autonomous thought and judgment. You know, sometimes when I think about the most negative policing cultures, it's where you've got that sort of unthinking uh, acceptance of rather awful um, uh, um, rules of thumb of kind of rather awful um, ideals, ideas which are kind of accepted as the way we do things around here. And I, the idea of autonomous thought and judgment that actually we don't uh, slavishly just accept kind of the group think uh, and, and get ourselves into all sorts of trouble, but that autonomy of thought, uh, it, you know, it's the very opposite. Uh, of a negative culture. So what does it mean to be making decisions in an ethical fashion? I think that's really, really important. And what does it mean to be reflective? And I'll talk about that in a minute. And the third bit is commitment to a set of principles. Uh, I, I guess from Chief Officer's point of view, we would point to um, either the attestation that which we swear on becoming constables, or in the UK we have our statement of mission and values. Uh, but you might be aware that the Home Secretary is very keen that we also have a code of ethics. But that sense in which there is... Um, conscious um, commitment to principles or ethical values and a constant kind of uh, assessment of what we do in the light of them. And one of the things that struck me over the last few issues around Lawrence, because a few of us in this room were around in those days, is that we were making decisions before FOI, Freedom of Information, had ever been passed. I, I suspect it was a, a gleam in the eye of the Labour government. Um, but one of the difficulties you've got is, is in many ways, the goalposts keep changing. And so decisions uh, that we're making today, you know, where might there be a kind of a different view taken? One of the things that we've been agonising over as chief officers, you know, those search engines enable us to do so much in terms of social media. But what is the expectation of privacy? What things are we technically capable of doing today, which actually in 10 years' time people will say that was a gross invasion. What on earth did you think you were doing thinking that was appropriate? So... For me, these kind of three things encapsulate uh, the profession, but with kind of knowledge, uh, evidence being uh, right there in the core. Um, San Lefter has written a little bit about professional knowledge. And again, just uh, worth pointing this out, you know, the, the kind of the classical idea about professional uh, knowledge, very much about um, that broad university arts-based education and then maybe going to do your teaching qualification or your accountancy qualification or in the old days, your legal qualification... Um, very classical approach. The trade approach, I argue, <clears throat> is probably where the police service has been. That sense of, uh, of apprenticeship, of practice, of, of learning through doing. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think it's sufficient uh, for 2013. Technocratic, uh, evidence-based policing, right uh, situated there, you know, uh, right in the heart of that. Scientific, standardisation, <coughs> formal control, rational. Um, and, you know, there are areas of the service uh, that have really needed to benefit from that, and I think they have. And this isn't a hierarchy at all, but I do think that technocratic is not sufficient, um, that actually what we want is people who can be reflective, who can interpret, because all the time we're dealing with situations of uncertainty, and it's bringing that order and that clarity to that uncertainty is the key thing. And uh, two things struck me. I, I went to... a uh, 
they call it a colloquium in Oxford, so I'll call it a colloquium, of surgeons about a year and a half ago who were talking about knowledge and how they teach surgeons. And I thought what was really interesting was, of course, it's lashings of science. You've got to understand all your physiology. But actually, um, the whole point about being reflective was really there and considering and thinking about it, but also the trade side. You know, you, you, you watch somebody do it, then you have a go at doing it under supervision, then you do it on your own. And it was really interesting to think about something which is really quite different from our world, uh, about how those different levels of knowledge interplay. So I'm not saying it's a hierarchy, but I just think we need to think of knowledge as, as being made up of all those, those parts. The other thing that struck me, particularly that last point, um, all the discussions that have been on the radio and TV over the last few days about Michael Gove's <coughs> curriculum, and if you heard the educationalists arguing, um, is it about teaching knowledge, facts, or is it about teaching understanding? And there's a really kind of uh, ding-dong of a debate in the education world about that. And I suspect I would argue for policing, like everything, it's not either or, but it's both. Um, it's always a good idea to uh, reference what your previous uh, boss wrote. So I've took this from Peter Nehru's uh, review of leadership and policing. Um, Peter's a happy man now. No, in all seriousness, I've given this a, a separate title, but I think the five points you make towards the beginning of your report really um, put the argument for the College of Policing, but I think put the argument for professionalising policing. You talk about uh, democratic accountability, uh, and one of the things that has struck me over the last couple of months, and I'm talking to somebody who's done a lot of work on this, is that, of course, police and crime commissioners that we have now uh, in England and Wales um, give you an election. They don't necessarily give you democratic accountability. And I think that's a really important difference, which I'm only just beginning to get my head around. An election does not give you democratic accountability, particularly if you've got a police and crime commissioner who's not interested in being re-elected, because it's a one-off and there's no ongoing relationship. So I think to think about what that means, you know, whether at the very local level it's about having... Um, we call them neighbourhood action groups, other people call them PACs, is it police and community together? You know, what are your local mechanisms for making sure that your local policing is responsive to the concerns uh, of local people? The second uh, issue is the, the legitimacy uh, word again, and again uh, mentioned there of the link to compliance. Um, of course, we need to understand uh, that whole point about uh, legitimacy, about why people think that, that we um, are on their side, that our power is legitimate, that we are doing it in a way that somehow you know, we're morally aligned uh, to, to what they think is, is required in terms of authority. Evidence-based, of course. Um, the fourth point, national and international coherence. Um, we have, um, you know, many parts of the world, very local forms of policing, and that's a, a very powerful uh, driver in policing but also the need in an in ever more interconnected world to think about what that means to work across boundaries. And so professional values can't just apply in one force, or indeed, I would suggest, in one country. We need to think about what it means across, across the board. And so the whole kind of development of the international profession of policing, I, I think, is a, a really important uh, issue for us. And, and lastly, um, uh, the issues around cost. Um, you all know, don't you, the, um, you know, if we've got less money... We need to be very clear about the way we do things, um, to what extent are they the most effective and the most efficient, so therefore the need for, for, for an evidence, evidence base. And, and despite the fact that you know, we all, uh, I think, heaved a sigh of relief two weeks ago in, in England and Wales, that the cuts weren't as bad as we might, thought they might have been uh, for next year and the year after, but they are still you know, a further 6 or 7% in real terms of every force budget, which is quite, quite a lot. So um, I hope... I try to put a very powerful argument for professionalising the police, I would then say, OK, what about the evidence? Uh, and I pinched a few slides here from um, one of Alex's members of staff, Rachel. Rachel, are you here? You are. They look fine with my logo on the bottom, don't they? <laughs> Rachel did these slides uh, last week uh, at a meeting I was at, and she's kindly let me borrow two, because I just wanted to situate what we're doing in policing in that broader government uh, commitment to the What Works centres. The little uh, picture there of, of Danny Alexander uh, launching it back, I think it was in March uh, this year. Uh, and the, the circles on the right, these are the variety of different What Works um, areas. So it's not just crime reduction, um, but whether it's early intervention, NICE, education, uh, endowment, foundation, etc., etc. 
Um, so it's, it's kind of not just something where we're doing, it's something that the whole uh, of government uh, aspires to do. The other thing that's worth saying, and we, we talked about this quite a lot, because uh, there was a debate at one point whether the College of Policing would have what works responsibility, whether it needed to be within the college. I think any of us who had anything to do with the college at that point thought it was really important it did. But note, it says crime reduction. It doesn't say policing. So it has kind of got that broader school, and I think that's really uh, very important. And the other slide, which I borrowed with pride from Rachel, is this, because I think most of you will be very familiar with the ladder um, going up from the, from the bottom. Um, you know, level one, just the one-off measures, no comparison site, two, um, just the before and after, etc., etc., leading all the way up to the best sort of evidence where we can be quite um, clear about what works, uh, the systematic review is based on, on studies from levels three and five up. So hopefully that's very familiar with any of you who have uh, spent any time here. Um, this is what uh, Rachel and her team are working on within the college. And I, I sat there listening to her talk about this because I kind of know the theory. And I was just thinking about what, what, what do we need to do next? It's about applying this not in the kind of the thesis we write, not in terms of the essays, but actually in the kind of day-to-day -day stuff. And I was just thinking of, of, of a few things um, that we've done over the last 12 months in Thames Valley and why somehow um, we don't always make the link. So, for example, uh, one of the things that came out a couple of weeks ago was the um, uh, EHRC, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, report on stop and search. Uh, and Thames Valley had been one of the sites uh, that we had uh, worked with the Commission, uh, and to some reasonable effect. And in uh, fact, Colin Payne, who's here, uh, helped me in the first uh, early days of that. Of course, when I think back to that, where is Colin? I did see it, Colin. I mean, I mean as ever, I was very keen to do something, if you remember. Um, and so we just wanted to do something to get the EHRC off our back. So we kind of scattered treatments at the problem. And... And, of course, some of them presumably worked because, actually, uh, levels of disproportionality went down, the level of unproductive searches went down, and we got the success or the, we got the effect that we wanted. But for whatever reason, when we were under that kind of um, pressure of the threat of legal action, then any sense of, of using that as a learning opportunity gets thrown out of the window. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, and I will embarrass you about but I was very keen to do a community kind of... Um, uh, panels in with what we do in High Wycombe where Gilbert Hawala is the, is the commander and of course he spent so long writing the most complicated RCT plan I've ever seen in my life that nothing really happened and we need to get somehow between that kind of urgency of me kind of scattergunning a load of treatments and, and, and some of them landing and working and then agonising over such a complicated RCT that actually somehow sabotaged the whole experiment so I, I don't know what the, the answer is but we need to kind of think together and I think it's about all of us and our various levels working out how we can take this great theory uh, and actually then um, and implement it in practice. Now, the other bit I wanted to talk about today was one of the things that struck me is that when we come here, we tend to talk about police treatments or crime reduction treatments. We're talking about the business of policing. And I think that's really, really important. But the other thing that I've been doing a little bit of work on or thinking about was about evidence-based management. So not actually what we do in terms of operational activity, but actually how we run our organisations. And if you start looking about evidence-based management, uh, you come across some very interesting stuff. And I, I've just um, cannibalised uh, a paper, it's a Harvard Business Review paper, I don't know mispronounced the names, Pfeffer and Sutton. And I thought when I read that, that was terribly uh, familiar. For most part, managers looking to cure their organisation ills rely on obsolete knowledge they picked up in school, long-standing but never proven traditions, patterns gleaned from experience, methods they happen to be skilled in applying, and information from vendors. And I, I guess for us, we don't have vendors as such, but you could say the community, politicians, consultants, who, whoever. Um, and the, the argument that these two uh, uh, business academics are making is that they, in terms of business, in terms of general management organisations, um, that actually evidence-based medicine has an awful lot uh, to, to offer. And it's ex exactly the same argument. So it kind of got me thinking about to what extent do our strategies uh, in, within our organisations... So it's not just about how we 
uh, choose tactics for policing, but it's actually about a broader issue about how we run our organisations. Um, but of course, it's not that straightforward because it is, I think, this idea about it being a mindset and it clashes with the way we often run organisations. Um, it features a willingness to put aside belief and conventional wisdom, the dangerous half-truths that many embrace and replace these with an unrelenting relenting commitment to gather the necessary facts before uh, making informed and intelligent decisions. And one of the questions that they pose in this paper, it said, does the chief exec always want to be right or do they want to lead a high-performing organisation? And I thought, I don't know whether this is true about international police forces in terms of your culture, but one of the great things about policing, but it's also, I think, the most debilitating, is that the chief is always right. Um, and, and if you're talking about evidence base, it's actually it's, it's, it's really quite countercultural because it's not about what the chief thinks and what the chief um, believes in. It's actually something which is much more radical and revolutionary than that. And so that the whole mindset thing, I think, is, this is a scary place, the top people. So do, do you want, does the chief always want to be right, or does the chief want to run an organisation which is effective and performs well? And I think that, for me, that's the key question. Um, they come up with four ideas which I thought were quite nice, and I think they could apply to all our organisations, and kind of, kind of, I don't know, four rules for all of us. Demand evidence. So somebody's suggesting what we should do, what is the evidence that this works? And they come up with an argument, what is the logic of that argument? Why are we saying that? Treat the organisation like an unfinished prototype. I think most of you who've done your Cambridge work know that there's so much data within the organisation. You don't have to go outside it. There's just so much data which is begging to be used. Uh, use that information. One of the interesting things about a lot of the um, uh, internet companies, and they, did, they reviewed place, companies like uh, Yahoo, Google, da 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 they, they using such volumes of data, they can do RCTs really easily because they can just put something on their front page. Um, and you know, thinking about what's effective for them is, is maybe much, uh, much easier, but they do treat the organisation like an unfinished prototype. And lastly, uh, embrace the attitude of wisdom um, and that sense in which it's not just facts, it is understanding, and that's what we all seek to achieve. And I think that's it. Thank you.